What's going on everybody? Gunner here. Uh, today we're going to be going over the glide fly. Now the glide fly is a predatory tube fly. Basically it's designed to be fished for fish that eat other fish. So you're talking smallmouth, largemouth, tarpon, and schnook, and peacock bass, and stripers. Anything that eats another fish. Um, it's kind of tied in a fusiform shape. Uh, it can be effectively tied anywhere from kind of 6 to 8 inches. I really like that. About 6, 7 inches kind of like a sweet spot for this one. Uh, just the way the materials lay out and the way it's designed to balance. Now I, I got to design this fly for an outfitter in Brazil uh, called Nomadic Waters. And I uh, just want to share real quick a handful of the pictures because um, that was just an uh, epic trip. And, and these flies, these two flies, they caught some really big old fish. Um, so this is just one of my favorite flies, period. <laughs> it's a predatory tube fly. And what I want you to understand is, is uh, I've recently filmed a video on tube flies, and it's kind of intended as a primer on tube flies and all my thoughts on tube flies and everything I know about tube flies. And it goes over in depth the design the balance, the reasons why, the material selection, how it's all laid out, why we're tying on weighted tubes, why I'm using short shank hooks, all that is answered in there. Now, there's going to be a lot of references in this video probably to that, just because I'm tying it and we're talking about it. But um, I really want this to be kind of a short and sweet recipe video that highlights the fly. Um, and so all of that information that you might be looking for is in that video, which is linked in the description. So go watch that if you haven't or watch it after this. So what we're going to tie is the glide fly. Um, and I want to show you guys real quick. This is what we're tying on. So this is HMH's, right? Vice Company. They make tube fly gear. HMH. This is their large diameter copper tube. Now, I typically tie on the small diameter copper tube, and I uh, don't have one out right now, so give me a sec. The reason why I got that out is because there's a split second of prep work to be able to tie on the small as compared to the large. And I'll get a close-up real quick on the difference between the two. So the large is in my left hand, this one, and this is the small. You can see that basically the only difference is the wall thickness. So the large has about three times as much material. That's what I like to use if you're gonna fish this, say, on a floating line. Uh, that'll have a nice little jig to it, break through the surface real quick. Um, and it's a little bit heavy to balance the system, but it has that head weight so that you can fish it on a, on a floating line system. The small diameter tube, much more lightweight, suspends perfectly, sinks nice and level. This is what is designed uh, to balance with the hook that I use. So I want to reference that real quick. Now, when you buy this packaging, it comes with liner tubing and it comes with junction tubing in the package already. So you don't have to worry about trying to find all that stuff. It's already prepackaged for you. Now the reason why it comes with a liner tubing is in case you want to fish this with a monofilament leader. So this is a square edged tube, right? It's just cut flush square. Now I run all these with a stainless steel leader and so I don't have to worry about that. I can just put this in my vise and tie on it. But if you're tying on a monofilament leader, what you wanna do is take the liner tubing that comes in the packaging, throw it in the inside of the tube here and you're gonna want a lighter and a bodkin. You're gonna melt the tube back. Don't burn it. You want to melt it. Keep your flame away from it a little bit. And then I make sure that I didn't collapse the hole of my tube. So I just run a bodkin through that and try to open that up real quick. Do that to the other side and now you have a tube that is lined with nylon so you're protecting your leader material so you can't cut it on accident. If that tube, you know, a fish grabs that tube and jerks it 90 degrees real quick, it could basically cut your leaner material off. So now you're protected and good to go. Now I showed you the difference between the small tube and the large tube and it's the outside diameter, not the inside diameter. So in order to prep this so that our junction tubing, which is the tubing that holds your hook, this is the tubing that is designed to go over and hold your hook, you can see, well this, well that's a different size tubing, hang on a sec. <laughs> You can see this, it kind of has a friction fit, but not really. And that's what the, the small tubes are different from the large tubes. The large tube, it has an extremely tight friction fit. You push that over and it's not coming off, right? So we need to prep the small tube so that we can friction fit that junction tubing once we've finished the flights, the last step that I do. 
So I'm going to come in with monofilament thread. You can use whatever thread you like, but I like to use mono. And I'm going to build up a thread base. And this is maybe, you know, I don't know what that is, probably a quarter of an inch of that inch long tube. I, didn't, I don't know if I mentioned that. These are inch long tubes. That's the length tube I like to tie in, one inch long for this recipe. And so I'm going to run that back and forth, let's say five times, and really build that diameter. Okay, we'll go on a few more than five. I fell off my tube there. I don't know how many times that was. You guys can count if you want, it doesn't matter. But just build it up so that you have a nice thick diameter. And this is gonna be far, have a lot more friction on it, a lot more friction on it. It's not just gonna pull off. Now I will super glue these together at the end, which will be the last step before we finish the head of the fly. And of course I'll walk you guys through that when we get there. But I run that with super glue. And that is how you prep the small diameter tubes to be able to tie on them. So let's jump into this recipe and run you guys through how to tie the glide fly. I backed you guys out just a little ways here on the camera just because this is a about a seven inch fly and I want you to be able to fit it all in frame. Now to start tying on my tube, of course I gotta overexpose you guys so that I can see what the heck's going on. Sorry, it's one of those things. but. You always want to start with just a tad touch of super glue. It's going to weld all this stuff together so none of it's slipping. And the first step that we're going to do is a dubbing loop with strung fuzzy fiber. And we're going to be tying this kind of in an olive over white. Kind of in an olive over white. I'm going to change a lot of the flash blends and have a little bit of fun with it. But you're, you're going to get the gist of it. And I'm going to intentionally make this fly more complex than it needs to be not more complicated not more compli like I'm I'm just I this part of this is a little bit of artistic you know having fun building a fly and you could tie this fly strung fuzzy fiber a little bit of big fly fiber SF SF and a head be done like you could do it like four or five steps be done but of course I'm gonna throw some flash blends and blend a lot of my SF with some flash and throw some cheeking material on that and I might blend the head with some ripple ice fiber so we're gonna have some fun with it and I'm gonna show you kind of like the full dressed version and you guys can dumb it down as you need so that it kind of fits your tying style but I like to overdo it just a little bit for fun so I'm tying with a 210 flat wax nylon you want a nice thick uh, strand ratio for working with the strung fuzzy fiber and that not using a GSP is going to allow us to be really accurate with our catches on the synthetics and the flashaboo which tends to be really really slippery so I like to use a, a kind of flat wax so I'm going to come in with strong fuzzy fiber and I'm going to cut off a little bit you don't need a whole bunch for this intruder bump just a little bit and if you've seen me work with this before, you know I like to take the full length, cut it in half, and then cut it in half again. So we have a quarter of our full length, and that is going to be my intruder bump. Now, you are going to want some wax on this, wherever that is. There she goes. Wax my thread real quick. If you can kind of space that out nice in your hand before you get started, it goes in a lot easier. Now, this tube, way thicker diameter, I shouldn't, yeah, well, diameter, that works, but basically circumference is the word I was looking for, than a hook shank, right? Now, when you go to palmer this strong fuzzy fiber, we're going to spin this up and wrap it around, right? You want this spread out a long way so that I can take not like one turn or two turns, but like five turns, because if you condense all this spin it up and you only get like one and a half turns now you got like 50 percent more material on one side of the tube than the other you want to space it out so that you can randomly distribute it and use the random the more turns you take the more consistent and even it's going to be that's important right because this is our base this is what everything is flared off of and you want it uniform i'm using a long not really long but just you know it's it's thrown throughout that loop and spread out a long way so that it's nice, even, consistent. I'm spinning this up 
while pulling it towards myself. This thing is always under tension. I never just quick spin this stuff. And the reason why is because I'm trying to get this stuff least trapped as possible. And when I go to turn this, you can see how thin that it's it's the thickness of my thread. Like there's nothing trapped around the thread, you guys. And I'm just gonna come in here and manhandle this stuff around my tube and build a perfectly symmetrical round intruder bump base. Now the reason why I'm doing this is when I tied this commercially for Nomadic Waters, I actually used my seven inch synthetic dubbing brush. And if you think about it, I could I got about five flies out of one brush. So it's actually extremely efficient to do it that way. Um, but for doing kind of one at a time, and I wanna show you guys a way to do it without a dubbing brush for everyone who doesn't make dubbing brushes. And what's cool is you can do this exact same technique on flies like my Imposter and my AllSpark. Um, and so this is how I, I do this uh, to kind of circumvent that whole dubbing brush thing. So you use strung fuzzy fiber for the core, and then I'll come in with big fly fiber straight. So this has no curl to it, and it's just straight fibers. And you don't need a lot, and, and something this fly is, is it's tied high and tight on the wings, right? But I didn't want this going through the water. I kind of want this going through the water, right? So we need to create a veil right here, because we have our wing top and our wing bottom. We need to create a veil that kind of it gives the illusion that there's something on the side of the fly, and the fly's not just separated top and bottom, right? So I'll take a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. Do not overdress this one. Basically, I kind of just hold that. If you hold your material at the midpoint, you can see how it's tapered. You guys see that? Like this is like, I don't know, 65% of my material, and this is about 35% of my material. That's the taper I'm looking for. I'm gonna make the ends a little bit uneven here, just so they're not all the same comb that out but you just pinch it way back here that's how you know the taper and this is the one step of the fly that's a little bit cumbersome and so I just put all that on top and then I just take my thumb and my left hand has thread pressure right now I never let go of this bobbin my hands always putting pressure on that bobbin so I can control how much tension is on my thread and you just simply use your fingernail and kind of just lightly chase that around this is to me is way easier than trying to just randomly throw it all on and hope it's 360 degrees. Kind of being a, I don't know if I'm OCD or if I'm just a perfectionist or I don't know what it is, but I like to make sure that this is perfectly distributed all the way around. Now I like the density that's on the top and it's on the sides and I have a little bare spot that's on the bottom. Check this out, you just take a pinch more Instead of working on this for like the next three minutes trying to get it perfect, just take a pinch more and stack that right on the bottom, right where your kind of bald spot is. You're good to go. Use that to flare that one out. Now if you come in and, and try to stroke all this back with your hands, it's going to be really hard not to draw unintentionally fibers and kind of uh, more on top or on the side. You're just going to pull them wherever they want to go. Use a push tool and allow that material to flare perfectly evenly. You can see how well distributed that is in that light. You wanna use a push tool so that you don't really put kind of human error into it and just let that fiber relax and lay back. And so now we have this beautiful tapered wing and because we folded it back, that's why you wanna do it sparse. We doubled it back so you have that 65, 35, Plus we tapered the end, so it was kind of like 65 to 75 and 25 to 35, maybe even 40, and so the, all the tips just bleed into each other. And you have this beautifully tapered, perfectly symmetrical, tied in the round veil that goes throughout the whole fly. Now, so far we haven't set the orientation. Everything's just tied in the round. And I'm gonna use the handle of my vise as my control. So this is now vertical and we're gonna stack our flash boot top and bottom and our wing top and bottom, put things on the sides and when we trim our head, I need to know where top and bottom is. So this is where you gotta start paying attention. Now I'm gonna come in with a complex flash boot blend. Flash boot has no consequence, no consequence whatsoever. All it does is take an extra tying step. This doesn't add any water weight, 
doesn't change the way it tracks, it doesn't change the way it fishes, it just gives the illusion of depth, depth, depth. So I have something that's like, uh, this is a dyed pearl series, it looks like orange dyed pearl. I have straight gold, just straight gold, straight silver, and I don't know what this is, it's like holographic mint maybe, or holographic green, but it's like an ocean green, it's not, you know, it's not chartreuse and it's not olive, but it's like an ocean green. And so I'm going to take because this is kind of an olive, olive over silver, we'll take like four of the silver, but it's also a nice bait fishy color, so I'm going to take three of the gold. That's my laundry machine. <laughs> the the dyed pearl series, it, it doesn't really overdo it, you know, I don't mind if I have, I'm going to take four of those ones, and then I just want a little bit of accent from the, the holographic greenish color, so I'm going to take two of those. Now this is Magnum Flashaboo. So this stuff is like forever long. It's 20 inches long, you guys, forever long. And so this fly is designed to be take all that. So I took four at the full length. That's what you have to understand. Four or three or two or however many I said, and then I cut it in half. So now I have twice as many strands. So if you use like standard Flashaboo or if you already have that stuff cut in half or whatever you do, you gotta double your strand count. And I'll just kind of roll that in my fingers and kind of hand blend that like that and then taper the tips so that they're not all flush. Come in here and I'll throw that again. If you just pinch it and see how the fibers rest, I got, I don't know, 65, 35. That's kind of that fusiform taper that I, I like this fly to rest at. And just like the big fly fiber, I'll throw it all on top. Now, I'm going to keep it all on top, but I want it to kind of veil the back. So I'm going to distribute it so that it like touches the side and touches the side, but it's all on the top. And we're going to counter shade this not only with color, but also with texture of flash, which is kind of an idea I've been playing with that I think is wicked cool. So not only can you counter shade something with color, right, it's olive over white, but we're also going to counter shade this with texture. So we're putting a flat flashaboo on the back, and you could do the exact opposite. I don't think it matters. I just think it's cool that they're different. But we're putting a flat tinsel on the back, magnum flash, and we're going to put a crinkled textured flashaboo, which is going to be accent flash, on the bottom. And if you're big fly fiber, my big fly fiber wing's a little bit long right now, I'll come in and you can trim all that stuff at the end just so it's picture perfect, but that'll be close. So I'm going to come in with accent flash. So this is flash boot accent, and it's textured, it's crimped, it's got a little twist to it, it reflects light differently. And something that I love, like if you're doing olive over white, which is what we're doing, do not just put olive flash over silver flash. Like, <laughs> I mean, you can, that's that's effective, but think about how much depth I just added with the gold and the, the orange dyed pearl and a little bit of green and some silver. And this is like a, a peachy color. It has some warmth to it and some texture, like a little bit of yellow cream belly up at the front of a walleye or something. Like it's not just, you know, just white or something, but like, Flashaboo can add tone and depth without changing your water weight and how it swims and tracks and all that stuff. So it's a really cool material. It just takes a tying step, right, to put it in. So I'm going to taper all those ends, pin that right to the bottom, and I'll just kind of kink that one way and then the other way. And so I just V-tied that. You can see there's some up top and there's some on the bottom. So I caught that once, took the ends going forward, and V-tied it, just like you kind of would a, a synthetic in the saltwater world. And then I'll flare that with my thumb, loosely trap that, and this stuff can tend to stick together a little bit, and if you just run your comb through it, it'll all veil that hole back perfectly. You gotta run your comb through it and it'll all separate, and that's how it'll rest in the water. Now, we've designated top and bottom mentally with our handle, and I'm going to set the side of my fly right now with, uh, what is this called? Lateral line flash. Now, again, I could just do this in silver, right? But we also have the opportunity for depth and tone. So this is a dyed pearl series, pink. Pink dyed pearl. Going with our orange, going with our peach, going with our gold. Like this is how you add so much color to a fly without actually doing anything. I'm not doing anything, I'm just 
blending some flashaboo. Absolutely love this stuff. So this sets the side. This is the exact midpoint of, the, of my side that I'm kind of designating in my mind. And so I want to make sure that these are perfectly 50-50 spot on because I'm going to use those as a reference visually when I cut the side of my head flush. So I need to know where that spot is so that I can line that up with my eyes and do it perfectly. Now, I need about this much room for my head, like literally a full quarter of an inch or more. You want to make sure you do not crowd this hook eye because we're going to pack a bunch of strong fuzzy fiber in there and make a really beautiful sculpted head. So I'm going to come in with my wing materials now. This is Steve Farrar blend, Steve Farrar blend, top and bottom. You can use a lot of cool materials. You can use uh, Icelandic sheep over the back. You can use Snow Runner over the back. You can use uh, Paul Beals. Frankenfly, he has a new uh, material called Werewolf Hair. You can use that over the back. They all do similar functions, which is tone and bulk. This is what I'm using for tone, olive over white, and bulk. All the flashy boo on the inside is for depth. Now, one of the cool things about putting all the flashy boo on the inside, you reduce. My camera just cut me off. <laughs> one of the cool things about putting the flashy boo on the inside you reduce its ability to foul because now it's all trapped and layered under your wing material and it all breathes out and sucks back in and breathes out and sucks back in. We didn't just drape a bunch of flash on the outside, but we tucked it and hit it on the inside, but it's all flaring over the intruder bump. Pretty cool. So I'm just going to take SF and what is this? I should peacock and this is UV white. Peacock and UV white. And you don't need a whole bunch, but you want a little bit more than not enough. <laughs> How is that for descriptive? You don't want a whole bunch, but you want a little bit more than not enough. Mm, I think that is what I call accuracy right there. Now, I tapered this. I never like a square edge. I always taper it. You just tough it out with your fingers. Get that off of there. Put that over the back. I kind of line it up so that I have just a little bit of flashy boo hanging out past that because it's kind of designed as a flash tail. Right, so I have just a little bit of flash boo over the back, and I'll shove my thumbnail right into that, and again, right on top, and then kind of melt it off to the sides a little bit. It's mostly high and tight, but I want that coming down onto the sides just a fair bit. And then we'll move on to the bottom. Now I like my top wing to be longer than my bottom wing. So I'll come in here and as I pull this out of the package, I'll just cut like two inches off the top of that. Throw a little taper into that. So now my bottom fibers are physically shorter than my top fibers. And just like everything, these are going on about 65, 35. And I'll pull that back and I'll leave this, this stack, the one I just reverse tied, mostly high and tight. And I'll leave this one mostly high and tight so that I get a lot of height out of that wing. I veil the first one so that it kind of, the first one veils the back, the second one builds the height. And so now I have my height really in the third part of my fly because it's the shorter fibers and that's how you build the fusy form. Because you want that third mark right about yay to be the bulkiest part of the fly and that's how you get a really nice kind of hydraulic swim and a little bit of water push and everything tapers back and has a beautiful three-dimensional kind of structured but mostly high and tight shape that blends in with our head. So I know I'm getting a little nerdy here but that's just what you guys get when you make me film a video. <laughs> Now I'm gonna put some cheeking material in here. Totally optional, but it's a lot of fun to do. This is wing and flash, and I'm gonna drape this dead center down the side, and it tucks right up, right up behind my head. Oh, I'll see if I can get this. Do you guys, so I have my lateral line flash. Man, I'll have to get a close up on this picture. Do you see this fluorescent yellow coming out right behind the head? Man, it's like the coolest, most beautiful little side flash that you can get. Anyway, I'm going to throw a little bit of copper in here just because I have my tannic watershed and I like copper. But it's mostly fluorescent yellow. That's what this one is, fluorescent yellow. And then a wee bit of copper. And so I'm using this to cheek the sides of the glide fly. And you don't really have to worry about blending them. I just kind of stacked one on top of the other because it's all going to get blended when you 
50-50 tie this thing. So I just pin that straight to the side. And I'm not too worried about it. Flare it with your thumb. Come up on top of that SF and now I have a nice full bodied cheek. And that's just 50-50 because the wing and flash is heavily tapered on its own, a lot of variable lengths. So you don't gotta worry about toughing that one out. It'll, it'll come pre-tuffed for you. you. Just tie that in. Move your thread down onto that shaft. Throw up a little thread bump. Not thread bump, but thread base. Man, this fly is beautifully complex. I love it. But it's simple. None of the tying steps are any different. It's just complex with color because each step that you do is an opportunity to manipulate and change the color. Soak that in some glue, weld all that together. Now while that glue is wet, I'm gonna form about a five and a half inch dubbing loop, wrap that right back to my head, right up to my two by, leave just a very minuscule section to tie that off. Super glue that knot, that half hitch right at the head, because while you're palmering this, I'm gonna put this in my bobbin rest, and if that slips off my tube, it all unravels. That's no bueno. So I always glue that real quick. Go heavy on the wax. <clears throat> and now we get to do the finishing touches, which is strung fuzzy fiber for the head. Now, if you recall, our intruder base was a quarter of the length of this. That's what my collar is going to be so that my base and my collar build relatively the same amount of bulk and it all bleeds into each other perfectly. So I like to use about the same amount of material and the same density and we're going to use it at the same length to build our collar here. So that's our collar. Make sure that this isn't all trapped onto itself here and I'll thread that in here. And this is a cool opportunity to again change the color. If you see a lot of the, the gray over white ones that I do, I'll do this in red and make kind of gills right there. But we're going to keep this one kind of just olive overweight. Now I'm going to come in and again, I'm going to cut this into quarters. But as I wrap this forward, I want the fibers to get shorter and shorter and shorter and kind of pre-taper our head for us to reduce all the trim work that I have to do. Now when I cut this, this is a quarter length. This is what my collar is. But I'm going to pinch this dead center at the midpoint. And now I'm going to cut one side of it. This forces you to create a long fiber, which is going to go in next, and then a shorter fiber, which is going to go in last, and that's how you're going to finish the fly. Slide that in there. Ba-boom. Now, I like that quarter inch collar to be nice and long. I want that to bleed into that. That can be nice and short and aggressive. That's a little bit too many fibers. And that is our tapered, you can see it as it goes up, our tapered head. And again, pulling this towards myself. You can, this is all under tension. Give this a nice, kind of slow, methodical spin here. Got strong fuzzy fiber all over the place. Now, I love blending strong fuzzy fiber with wing and flash, ripple ice fiber. You can do it with polar flash. It blends so well. But, the finishing step to this fly is to dunk the head in soft tex, which is quite exciting actually, and I'm looking forward to getting to it. But I'm going to show you guys. It kind of dulls the whole head and kind of defeats the purpose of putting flash throughout the whole thing. So it's kind of an unnecessary step that you don't have to do on this pattern in particular, but I kind of like it on the, the death grips now and the geezers and the slow jig clousers, all that. Anytime you can just flash throughout saturated it's a beautiful thing so that's picked out come in here draw all of this to one side of your your dubbing loop here and again it's as thin as my tying thread you can see how dense that core is Ooh, psh, it's as thin as my tying thread and because we are going to pack this stuff on here like like it should be like a full-blown deer head by the time you're done with it with how dense it is so I'm just going to walk this really, really tight every time. I'm just going for half a turn, manhandling this stuff. If I was tying on a pedestal base, I'd be dragging that base all over this table because I put so much tension on this thread while I do this. 
You do not, this is not some light, you know, dainty wrap and a hackle and you hope you don't break it type thing. This is 210 flat waxed full of a bunch of crimped nylon and you can beat it up. No worries. So you gotta be a pretty good judge of your space here so that you can trap that off picture perfectly right at the eye of that tube. Caught my loop here. And this is another reason why you don't want to use GSP. It's so slick that when you get to the head right here, it's nearly impossible to tie it off without it sliding all over the place and ruining your head. So that's tied off. I'm going to draw that back, throw a half hitch on here while drawing it all back. You see my threads, it's always going backwards. I can't let this stuff slide off the, the front of this tube. I'm going to do a whip finish while drawing everything back. Everything's being pulled back. And that is how you finish a really technical tube without screwing that one up. <laughs> and I don't know, I probably messed up maybe one out of ten flies when I was tying them for nomadic waters and would just have to kind of redo the head, but it's actually more consistent than you think. You get the spacing down pretty quickly. But you do want to super glue that real quick here before I start beating this whole head to death with a comb and picking it all out. Weld all that together. beans. I got one thing of strong fuzz that was looped up there. So that is a beautiful bulky synthetic head. This is a great way by the way to finish off a musky fly right here. That strong fuzzy fiber done in a loop like that. But anyway again I'm going to come in with a single edged razor blade. I'm going to use my handle as a reference going to use my lateral line flash as a reference and I what you want to do is you want to hold your blade at a 45 degree angle, right? Because now when I push this, it's actually drawing through the head. I think a lot of people when they work with razor blades, they, they push a flat blade into the head. They push it instead of drawing it. Do you see the difference between a push and a draw? A draw cuts. A push is trying not, not cutting one fiber at a time, but you're trying to cut about 50. And it's gonna catch, 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 and then slip and you're gonna gouge this head to death. You don't wanna do that. Hold it at an angle, draw it down as you push it forward, and I'm using my handle and my flash as a reference. You can see a draw, draw, draw. And that's exactly what you wanna do anytime you're working with deer here. You wanna draw, 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 draw. And that's how you get a nice, accurate head where you cannot take more fibers than you meant to, right? Because it's not gonna catch and gouge and dig. Nice, draw, draw, draw. And so I have, I just cut a hind tight head, but because I have a dubbing loop, it's structured all the way around. You could stack it, but then you kind of have, if you stack it, you kind of have naked sides and it doesn't have any three dimensional kind of realistic bulk that bleeds into the whole fly. When you do a dubbing loop, it's all packed in there and then I can sculpt the side to whatever shape and however width I want it. So I like to do that, just like that. Call that good. Now I'm gonna come in with Shugu. I like Shugu. I like to match the viscosity of my glue with the coarseness of my material. The coarser it is, the more viscosity I like. Shugu is phenomenal. You do want this stuff to set up for hours before you dunk it into soft text or you'll kind of get a reaction there that doesn't like itself. So let this set up overnight before you dunk it. But I'm going to come up with 3 8 inch eyes, 3 eighths of an inch eye. That's about 10 millimeters, it's pretty close. I think it's like 9.7 or something. But it's basically a 10 millimeter eye or 3 eighths of an inch. Now this is also from Flashaboo. So we've used strong fuzzy fiber, big fly fiber, Magnum Flashaboo, uh, strong fuzzy fiber again, also wing and flash and accent flash and eyes. These are super pearl eyes or uh, Mirage Flashaboo eyes. All from Hedron Inc, right? So it's all Hedron stuff except the SF blend. Now I'm going to use a sacrifice an old bodkin here. It's kind of my glue bodkin. You also want a rag or a paper towel to clean your bodkin off, but you want to use about a pupil-sized dab of shoe goo 
and it's nice and viscous. You got plenty of working time here and it takes about five minutes to kind of set up hard. And I'm just gonna work that into the head here. That side has a little bit more than I like, so I'll put that on the other side. And I like to work that, you wanna work that into that fiber. Clean off my tube. Take my eye here. Use your tube as a reference so that you can split that perfectly 50-50 for symmetry. We're gonna use these eyes basically to make kind of a Popovic style spread fly head that I refer to as a jerk fly, right? We're gonna get this nice high and tight sail on this head that's gonna allow the fly to dig and turn sideways in the water column because we're gonna keel it and balance it. And then I'd like to take a pair of tweezers Pinch these eyes. Now, something that's extremely critical with your tweezer work here, if you choose to use tweezers, these are dome eyes. And I should get this in place before I start jabbering. Now, these are domed eyes, three-dimensional eyes. We have to understand about a, a 3D eye here. What you have to understand about a 3D eye, you take that big, we'll say it's cupped, it's domed like this, right? Boom, 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 boom. Well, if your tweezers are in the front, it's pushing it back, and if they're in the back, they're pushing it front. You have to hit that dome right down the apex with your tweezers so that all the pressure goes in. So you want to make sure that or else this is going to be slipping while that's curing. They won't end up symmetrical. Is it the biggest deal? Probably not, but it bugs me. <laughs> so this fly is done. There's not much I can do to it until those eyes dry. And typically I'll just, I'll do the eyes on another vise so I can keep tying. But what I want to show you guys is how to finish one of these. Cause I got a whole bunch of them tied. And this one's on the small tube. I'll try to put the camera over here and show you guys how to finish rigging this fly right here. See these? Same fly, different color combo, kind of, more or less the same. But I'll show you how to get the junction tubing on there. I'll show you how to rig it with a hook real quick for the dunking process. And I'll show you how to put a soft hex head on this fly. And actually, I'm probably going to do all these flies right now and let them all hang dry. And that way, I got some bugs to fish come springtime. So I got you guys zoomed in here. And you want to take your junction tubing, which is the large diameter kind of soft tubing. You do not want to cut this too short. If anything, you want to make it a little long and trim it down later. But this is probably close to three quarters of an inch, a little bit more than half an inch maybe. So I'm going to take all this material and flare it away from my intruder bump. You can see my tube sticking out there. And I might be able to do this without lighting. Yeah, I can do that. And so I aggressively, once those eyes are cured, they're not going anywhere. And you can aggressively fold this material dam back. And I have the back end of my tube exposed. You want to come in here with some super glue. This is just Zappa Gap brushable. Makes a nice even, even coating. And I'm coating that monofilament thread bump that I made. And now I can push this junction tubing on and plastic weld this stuff together. Now, do not push that junction tubing all the way to the base of your material or it's gonna flare it all out at 90 degrees. I want that material to be the only thing flaring it. So leave a little air gap between your junction tubing and your material base so that it's not forcing that stuff out. And then I'm just gonna pinch that stuff on there while that glue sets up. Now, this junction tubing, I have enough room in here that I can not only fit a full hook eye but also a knot. You need a full hook eye plus a knot. It's super important. And so, and that's especially if you're just tying it, you're not yourself. I'll show you how to build a leader in a different video. But that's a little bit long. I'll probably trim that shorter on the water, but that's all you need to do right now. <clears throat> so I'm gonna rig the rest of these with hooks 
and then I'll walk you over to my little drying rack here and we'll get these guys dunked in soft text and then I'll talk about the head at the end here. Let's just real quick while I'm dunking these. The ideal hook for this uh, streamer so that it's perfectly balanced is the Kona Big Game Hunters in a 4 uh, Extremely nice wide gap thick wire short shank hook. You can also use the Gamakatsu SL12S 1X short. You have to get the 1X short. That's the correct model to get everything to balance. But It's going to be a little tricky to show, but I'll do my best. But the head of these flies is all soft tex. It's basically a liquid plastic or liquid rubber. Liquid rubber would be more accurate. And all you want to do, all these are pre-rigged with hooks so that I have something to hang on to. I have a little piece of cardboard right here so that I can stick the hooks into. I have something on the floor in case the plastic drips. And then you just want a little piece of wire. You can use a really small bodkin if you have a really small bodkin to clean the inside of the tube out and a rag. So this is a whole bunch of stuff, but it all comes in handy. thing sealed on there. But that's okay because I got a bunch of jars of this stuff. There we go. Use this stuff in a well ventilated area, preferably a garage, or if you use it in a clo <coughs> closed room like this, dunk it, close the door, get out, don't open that door for like 24 hours. This stuff, you do not want this stuff going up your nose. It is not a fun experience. So what you're going to do, make sure you know where your wire is and your cloth is. Fold all this stuff back. Dunk that just behind the eye. I dunked it all the way and then a little bit past the eye. And then I dab the excess off on a towel here. That's good to go. Take this little pin. Make sure I don't have any stuff inside my tube. Obviously if you have stuff in, the, in your tube you can heat up a pen and melt it later but it's easier if you just clean it out and then you hang dry it and you want to hang it head down I thought at first if I hung it the other way it could like soak into the wing and stuff and create like a cool three-dimensional textured fly which you can but the moment it touches that flashy boot it runs the length of your wing and it ruins your whole wing system so you can't do it that way you gotta dunk it and leave it head down and just dunk it as far back as you want it to soak up and that's how you control that. <clears throat> Alright, so while that stuff's drying I want to talk about this head real quick because it's one of the coolest heads that I think I've ever done. It's also one of the most durable heads that I've ever done, period. The stuff is like crazy rock solid hard when it dries and it takes, you want it in like three or four hours. I just do it at night then I'm not breathing in the fumes during the day. Like you don't want to do this like first thing in your office. But that head design, right? If you think about strung fuzzy fiber, it's it, it's a lot. I probably have, I don't know. We did a collar. We did the, the kind of a coarse head, and then we did the short head, and then we trim everything. I, I didn't show trimming the head. I got to trim that head once those eyes are dry. I'll show you that real quick before I dunk it. But what you saw when I folded everything back and put the junction tubing on, basically the eyes take up most of that fly, right? And, and so there was only one super glue step and when you dunk that stuff in Softex, the Softex soaks all the way into the tube and I dunked it just behind the eye. So everything that's on that tube right now, all the way to the core is coated now in liquid rubber. Really cool durability thing, right? The second thing that's really cool about it is it takes almost all of the viscosity out of the head. And so if you think about, that's, this is what I was getting to, but you have the, the, the collar, then you have the shorter head, and then the shortest head. That's like maybe 500 individual strands of fibers and big or, uh, strong fuzzy fibers crimped. It's really small crimped. And a crimped fiber has more surface area than a straight fiber, so it slows water down because the water has to follow the crimp as it goes over the head, right? So if you think about all of that stuff, I just took those 500 little fibers that are all slowing water down, and I sealed it and so water hits it, separates one time, and goes around the head into the wing. So it creates a vertically structured sail that can't collapse, you can't get behind the eyes, you can't lift the eyes, the eyes do not come off because it's structured. Not because Shugu's the bomb, but it is, but because the whole head's structured, the eyes can't come off. And it takes all the viscosity out and it creates this permanent high and tight sail that can't flex in the water. So when this thing turns, it cuts. 
Like it, that's why it's called the glide fly. It cuts ridiculously cool. Of course this summer I'll get some swimming footage for you guys on how it swims. But these eyes are probably dry and let me show you how to trim this head. And then I gotta go feed a baby. Check it out. I hope that was recording, shoot. And so that's just that. So all you do, you take that out of the vise and then you just come in and kind of just wedge taper this head real quick. Cut most of that stuff off there, clean it up, clean up the belly a little bit. And that is your finished head, ready for some junction tubing and a hook and to be dunked in Softex. That is the Glide Fly. Thanks for watching everybody. Tie one up, fish it, and uh, yeah, let me know how they do for you guys. It's absolutely one of my favorite bait fish flies, period, let alone the fact that it's on a tube and I can rig it however the heck I want. So thanks for watching. If you haven't seen uh, the tube fly primer yet, go watch that. Hopefully it'll make all of this make even a little bit more sense uh, and get you guys excited about some tube flies. See ya.